from the Federal Judicial Center, I'm Beth Wiggins, Director of the Center's Research Division, and this is Term Talk. Joining me today are Lori Levinson, Professor of Law, and David W. Burcham, Chair in Ethical Advocacy at the Loyola Law School, and Evan Lee, Professor Emeritus at UC Hastings School of Law. Thank you both for being here. The Supreme Court heard several civil rights cases this term. We discussed two other cases involving claims under 1983, Vega v. Teco and Thompson v. Clark in another episode. Today we're discussing two cases that arose under 1983 and that were decided without argument. Revis Villegas v. Cortes Luna and City of Tahlequah, Oklahoma v. Bond, as well as a third, Egbert v. Belay, that arose under Bivens. So, Lori, let's start with Rivas Villegas versus Cortes Luna. Yes, Beth. Uh, the facts of this case, there was a chilling domestic abuse situation. A woman and two children were barricaded in a room. Now, the 12-year-old child called 911 and was able to describe the situation. The perpetrator was alleged to have a chainsaw and was in a drunken rampage going through the house, destroying things throughout. The 911 operator actually heard the chainsaw in the background and believed that Cortes Luna might be trying to saw through the door. So it's in that situation that the police arrive and they order Cortes Luna to come to the front door. He's generally compliant. He drops the metal tool when commanded to do so. But the police in apprehending him also see that he has a knife in his left pocket. And at one point he actually reached for it. He was ordered to the ground, and while another officer removed the knife, Officer Rivas Villegas briefly, now less than eight seconds, placed his knee on the left side of Cortes Luna's back. Cortes Luna ended up bringing a lawsuit under 1983, alleging that the knee on his back was excessive force. The district court granted summary judgment for the police officer, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed saying that the officer had been on notice that his conduct constituted excessive force. It was in that posture that the case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit. So, Evan, what was the court's reasoning in overturning the Ninth? The court held that the cases relied upon by the Ninth Circuit here, the circuit precedents, were distinguishable from the facts of the case at bar. Um, that the circuit precedents didn't provide notice to a reasonable officer. Uh, And in so holding, the Supreme Court uh, stated that the precedent must be beyond debate. And furthermore, that it has to be very, very fact specific, the analysis, uh, and not based on general abstract rules of law. The Supreme Court looked at Uh, one precedent in the Ninth Circuit in particular called Lalonde versus City of Riverside because that was the case that the Ninth Circuit had relied upon most heavily. And the Supreme Court said, this case, Lalonde, is distinguishable from the case at bar in three key ways. First of all, in Lalonde, the officers were responding to a noise complaint, whereas here the complaint was there was a man who was cornering his family members with a chainsaw and in a drunken rage. Second, in uh, Lalonde, the officers confronted the plaintiff when he opened the door in his underwear carrying a sandwich. Again, here, he was carrying a chainsaw. And third, in Lalonde, um, the officers had pepper sprayed and subdued the plaintiff and then nonetheless dug a knee into his back, injuring him. And the court said, these two cases are not sufficiently alike to put the officers here on notice. And I think it's important to note that in this case, the Supreme Court says that it's merely assuming for the sake of argument that circuit precedent, any circuit precedent, can clearly establish law for the purposes of qualified immunity analysis. It is not endorsing that proposition. Okay, thanks, Evan. So let's move on to the other 1983 case. Um, What happened in city of Tahlequah, Oklahoma versus Bond? On August 12th, 2016, 
Dominic Rollis's ex-wife, Joy, called 911 to report that um, an intoxicated Dominic was in her garage and that he refused to leave. Uh, he didn't live in the house, but he did keep his tools in the garage. And she told dispatchers that uh, it was about to get ugly real quick. The police talked to Dominic through the side door of the garage, trying to get him to leave, but he refused to do so. And he refused to allow them to pat him down. So they followed him um, into the garage. They never got closer than six feet. And then he walked toward the back of the garage where his tools were hanging. He grabbed a hammer and he turned toward the officers, raising that hammer like a baseball bat and refusing to drop it on command. He then took a step toward the officers, raising the hammer as if he were about to throw it and maybe charge the officers. And that's when they shot him dead. His estate brought suit under section 1983 for excessive force. The district court granted summary judgment in favor of the officers, both on the merits and on the basis of qualified immunity. But the Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit reversed, citing precedent from the 10th Circuit. And then the United States Supreme Court in turn reversed the Court of Appeals. So Laurie, how did the court reach this decision? Well, the Supreme Court looked at what the Tenth Circuit had said. The Tenth Circuit said that the officers could be liable for excessive force if, quote, their reckless or deliberate conduct created a situation requiring the use of deadly force. And here, the Tenth Circuit had said qualified immunity did not apply because in the Tenth Circuit, there were several cases that clearly established that the officer's conduct was unlawful. When the Supreme Court took a closer look at this, they said that, no, that's not accurate, that under these facts, the officers plainly did not violate clearly established law, and that the cases that had been relied upon were not sufficiently the same to put the officers on notice. Additionally, the Supreme Court cited District of Columbia versus Westby, and in that case, it was said, quote, that the rules contours must be so well defined that it is clear to a reasonable officer that his conduct was unlawful in the situation he confronted. Given the facts of this case, they didn't think it was. So Laurie, given that, what are the takeaways for the lower courts from these cases? Well, Beth, I think in both Rivas uh, Viegas and City of Calacla, uh, qualified immunity remains a substantial hurdle in 1983 cases. And in fact, some justices have suggested that even if there's precedent in the circuit courts, uh, that would not be sufficient to show clearly established law. They would like it to be Supreme Court precedent. So Evan, how about you? Uh, yeah, I would have to agree with Lori on this, uh, that um, we might see a case um, in the future where the court restricts qualified immunity analysis to Supreme Court precedents only and not allowing circuit precedents. But that's not what this case does. That would be the future. In terms of the present, after this case, what we know is that clearly established law is a very high bar. We also know that qualified immunity is supposed to be decided on pinpoint facts and not on abstract principles of law. However, the court did also here recite a phrase, I think a telling phrase from one of its uh, prior cases. The phrase is this, qualified immunity is meant to protect all but the plainly incompetent or those knowingly violating the law. So let's move on to Egbert versus Boulay, the Bivens case. So Evan, can you tell us what happened in this case? Uh, yeah, uh, Boulay uh, owned and operated a, a bed and breakfast uh, on uh, in Washington State on the Canadian border. It was called Smugglers Inn. Um, it often housed and facilitated illegal entry into the United States um, from Canada. At the same time, when um, 
Boulay would have such quote unquote persons of interest, he would alert the US Border Patrol. Um, in this case, Boulay alerted Egbert of the arrival of a Turkish national. Egbert was suspicious. He followed the SUV carrying this Turkish national to check the passenger's immigration status. Boulay at that point asked Egbert to leave the property. Instead, Egbert allegedly slammed Boulay into the vehicle and then subsequently to the ground, injuring him. Boulay filed complaints with Egbert's supervisor and he filed an administrative claim with the Border Patrol, which found that Egbert had acted improperly but didn't punish him. Boulay also alleged that Egbert had retaliated against him by influencing the IRS to audit Boulay's taxes. Boulay then filed a Bivens claim alleging that the retaliation, the IRS claim, that violated the First Amendment. And, that the, uh, and he also alleged excessive force under the Fourth Amendment. And again, just to remind everybody, Bivens recognizes a claim in federal court for money damages against individual federal officers for certain constitutional violations. So the district court in this case ruled for Agent Egbert, but the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, reversed on both counts. The Supreme Court, in turn, per Justice Thomas, reversed the Court of Appeals, dismissing both the uh, excessive force claim and the retaliation claim. So, Lori, can you explain how the court reached this decision? Yes, Beth. Um, you might recall that in 2020, the court applied a recently created two-part framework to analyze Bivens' claims, the case of Fernandez versus Mesa. And the two parts were, one, are the fact pattern meaningfully different from uh, the prior allowed Bivens' claim? And second, if so, uh, are there special factors that counsel against recognizing the new Bivens claims, things such as Congress is in a better position to weigh the costs and benefits or, or there are national security interests. Here in this case, the Supreme Court actually condensed these two questions into one. And that question is, is there any reason to think that Congress might be better equipped to create a damages remedy? And has Congress created or authorized an executive branch to create an alternative remedial structure, whether or not that's particularly sufficient. In this case, it involves national security interests. And so even though it's not occurring exactly on the border and between a U.S. citizen and, and an agent in a particular way, the particular facts do not matter. There is another remedy that exists, which are the Border Patrol grievance process. What's interesting, Beth, is that when you take a look at this case and you ask the question, what does this mean for Bivens? Justice Gorsuch, in his concurrence, said, we're giving false hope that we're leaving Bivens in place and that it might apply to future cases. We should just take the step to overturn it. So, Evan, there was also a dissent. What did it say? The dissenters agreed with the majority that the First Amendment retaliation claim um, would constitute an extension of Bivens and therefore um, it should not be recognized. But they strongly disagreed with the majority regarding the excessive force claim, which they said was really not materially distinguishable on its facts from the facts of Bivens itself. Furthermore, the dissenters said that collapsing the two-step analysis that Laurie talked about into a single, even more restrictive step is improper. And the dissenters assert that even now, Fourth Amendment excessive force claims under Bivens can still be brought against federal agents just now, not against Border Patrol agents. So, Evan, what should the lower courts take away from this case? Well, that's kind of the $64 question uh, when you have a case that, uh, like Bivens, has not been formally overruled, but the court uh, grants cert every few years to say uh, that it shouldn't be read expansively. Um, I would say we ought to look back and 
canvas the three decisions, the only three decisions in which the US Supreme Court has ever upheld a Bivens claim. Bivens, Bivens itself, Davis versus Passman, and Carlson versus Green. And if a case comes up that is materially indistinguishable from the facts of one of those three cases, then you've got a good Bivens action, probably not otherwise. How about you, Laurie? I agree with Evan. I mean, there's a long line of cases now refusing to extend Bivens. And given these recent decisions and given this new standard, the Supreme Court doesn't really need to overturn Bivens. They've just limited it to what's already been established. Well, thank you both for joining me today and look forward to seeing you soon.